Good morning to those of you who are joining us in the Americas. Good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from other parts of the world. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I am Associate Professor for International Affairs at the New School in New York. Um, I'm also co-director of its India-China Institute. So I would like to welcome you all today to today's panel, which is on climate change perspectives from the Global South. Um, international negotiations and narratives about climate change have been typically dominated by technical frameworks of carbon emissions and net zero targets. While these frameworks have been crucial in articulating some types of meanings and some types of climate ambitions, they have not necessarily captured what are the very complex challenges and priorities that face many parts of the world, parts of the world that are often coping with some of the most intense effects of climate change. These challenges have been varied. They are often centered around issues such as availability of water, um, rise in extreme heat. There have been concerns about shifts in patterns of biodiversity, land use, and agriculture. There have been concerns about migration, livelihoods, and labor, and much more. All these issues are undoubtedly connected to emissions, yet the knowledge, the targets, the interventions that they demand are more complex than captured by the dominant emissions framework. There are also a whole set of entirely different narratives about climate change that are emerging from grassroots communities, both in the North and in the South, that view climate change not as the main problem, but rather symptomatic of a broader problem of civilizational logics of extraction. Again, emissions are part of that picture, but the canvas that these alternative narratives traverse is much bigger. So in today's panel, we hope to capture some of these varied narratives that are coming from different parts of the world. Um, we have a distinguished panel of practitioner experts who will discuss climate imperatives that have emerged in India, China, Latin America, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, theirs are not meant to be official narratives. There is no one common stand of the global South that they necessarily represent. Uh, but rather through their plurality, we hope to open up the conversation and to provide alternatives to the dominant narrative that is commonly displayed in international negotiations and is also a narrative that is often captive to intractable geopolitical North-South logics. I should note that this panel is part of an ongoing series of panels of the India-China Institute on shifting world orders um, through these public conversations, the India-China Institute is seeking to trace emerging political, technological, economic arrangements that are increasingly replacing an older international order that used to be dominated by US leadership and putatively liberal norms. Uh, so the way we'll proceed now is I'm going to introduce each of the four panelists, and then I'm going to hand it over to them. Um, after all of them have spoken, um, I will open up the the I, I'll open up the um, uh, forum for questions and answers. Um, the chat function is um, disabled for the audience, but the audience can put their questions in the Q and A box. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A box um, while the panelists are speaking, and definitely towards the end. Um, but let me at this point introduce the panelists that we are very fortunate to have today. Um, the first speaker is going to be Nagraj Adve, who's joining us from India. He is a member of the Teachers Against Climate Crisis. Um, Nagraj has been speaking and writing on the science, on the impacts and politics of global warming for the last 17 years. Um, He's the author of the book, Global Warming in India, Science, Impacts and Politics, um, which was published by Ekalavya, um, and it was also published in Hindi. Um, he has published widely articles on climate change, um, which, have been, which have come out in the Economic and Political Weekly, Science and Society, the Hindu, the India Forum, Jacobin, Wire, and many other publications. The second um, speaker today is going to be Hamza Hamushan. 
He is an Algerian research activist, commentator, and a founding member of Algeria Solidarity Campaign and the Environmental Justice North Africa Movement. Um, he currently serves as the program coordinator for North Africa at the Transnational Institute. Um, his work has centered around issues of extractivism, resources, land and food sovereignty, as well as climate, environmental and trade justice. He is the author and editor of four books, including Dismantling Green Colonialism, Energy and Climate Justice in the Arab Region, The Arab Uprisings, A Decade of Struggles, The Struggle for Energy Democracy in the Maghreb, and The Coming Revolution to North Africa, The Struggle for Climate Justice. His writings too have appeared in a range of publications, including The Guardian, Middle East Eye, Counterpunch, um, Open Democracy, and, and more. Our third speaker is Li Bo, who serves as a senior consultant on China's environment, regenerative agriculture, and climate at the Shanshui Conservation Center in Peking University. Um, Li Bo's work has focused on research at the intersection of environment and economics, and he's been involved in the work of diverse <coughs> NGOs that work on rural livelihoods, indigenous knowledge, natural resource management, and World Heritage Management in Yunnan, um, community-based tourism, biodiversity conservation, and NGO-led advocacy for transparent dam site decision-making in China. Um, along his appointment at Peking University, he's also been affiliated to the Stockholm Environmental Institute in Bangkok, um, and has been a researcher of environmental justice at the Institute of Environmental Laws at Zhongnan University of Economics and Law in Wuhan, Central China. Um, he also just noted to me that he is a part-time organic farmer. Uh, Libo, I should also note, is a former fellow of the India-China Institute, where he was also a visiting scholar in 2013. Our final speaker is going to be Jaimena um, Ledo. She is the Director of Global Initiatives and Head of Peace, Climate and Sustainable Development at the International Peace Institute. Before joining the International Peace Institute, Jimena was at the permanent mission of Guatemala to the UN in New York, where she last served as counselor. Uh, Guatemala and Colombia were the first countries that developed the idea of the sustainable development goals, and Jimena played a key role in crafting this global framework. She was also Guatemala's lead negotiator for the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, Jimena has represented the voice of the developing world in multiple negotiations at the UN around climate, but also around other issues. Um, so we are very privileged to have all of you here. Um, the order in which we'll the panelists will speak will be Nagra Julko first, and then Hamza, um, then Libo, and then Jimena, um, after which we'll have a Q&A session. So without much ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nagraj. Nagraj, you're on mute. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Manjari, and thank you for inviting me to this most interesting discussion I'm looking forward to. So we're actually having this discussion at a moment in history in which global warming has gone off the charts. The WMO's State of the Global Climate 2023, released two days ago, underlines how many records have been just shattered, including last year's average warming level of 1.45 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, beating the 2016 record warming by a staggering 0 0.16 degrees. Even the world's most respected scientists are jolted. For instance, last week, Gavin Schmidt, head of the Goddard Institute at NASA, was reported in the New Yorker as saying, we don't really know what's going on. And we haven't really known what's been going on since about March of last year. This most more rapid rate of warming of the last few years has meant accelerated impacts in India. In a social context in which average land holding per household is merely 2.5 acres, that compares with an average of 444 acres in the United States, a context in which half of all agricultural land is not irrigated and hence farmers are dependent on the vagaries of rainfall, and where millions of workers work outdoors in extreme heat in all kinds of informal jobs. If one could isolate three impacts in India among many, it is extreme heat, the flooding of cities, 
and irregular rainfall. Millions of workers are exposed to greater, longer, and more intense heat waves. For instance, at a meeting a month ago with, with construction workers and other informal sector workers that I had had from different states, waste workers talked about more fires from landfills near where they are due to the extreme heat, where even staying in their homes, they said, got difficult. Women, home-based workers and domestic workers talked of the challenges during flooding in cities, unable to work during these floods. And I have talked to them during the floods this year. For small and marginal farmers, the crop damage has become far more frequent. And there's no compensation if you're a tenant farmer in India. So it's just some of the largest social groups that I'm touching upon in terms of accelerating impacts. Now, these intensifying extreme events have certainly meant greater awareness about climate change. According to a study from the Yale program on climate change communication, 84% of people in India think that global warming is happening 15% higher than a decade ago. However, despite this greater awareness, it is not yet a campaign issue for the largest and most important social groups, such as farmers, working people, and their collectors. See, unlike in the US, climate change is not a serious electoral issue in India. So the largest election in the world is going to take place in India next month, but climate change is largely not an electoral issue. At most, it might find token mention in some of the manifestos of the political parties. A senior farmer's leader told me a few weeks ago, though farmers realize, he said, that nothing is normal compared to a decade ago, the usual, the usual response is compensation related. That is, <laughs> limited to compensation. There have been vibrant farmer struggles over the last two years in India against farm laws and for a minimum support price. However, ecological concerns are at the margins at best, and that's because small and marginal farmers and have a lot of other immediate concerns on their on their plate. Among workers, unions, and the organizations that represent them, over the last six, seven years or so, there has been some discussion about the question of a just transition and what an energy transition away from coal would imply for the millions of jobs of workers in coal mining, thermal plants, and related occupations and also workers in the automobile and auto parts sector as they move away from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. But again, barring a few unions, among most trade unions in India, there's skepticism about the shift away from coal. One senior trade union leader at Coal India, which is one of the largest coal companies in the world, reportedly said at a meeting ago, and I was told this by another union leader who was present, he said that this, this leader said that all the talk of climate change and energy transition works in Germany and France, not here in India. We are coal dependent. Besides these large social factors, there are a number of active NGOs who are active in different ways, and some of them do fine work, but there's no coherent mass campaign around various issues around climate change. So what this implies is that there is pressure on the state from below for adaptation, for building safety nets, and only for adaptation. Now, state capacities in India have certainly improved, for example, in better cyclone warning systems or in heat action plans that are operational to a degree in a certain number of states. But a lot of, despite that, a lot of potential adaptation measures, which I'll touch upon later, are either unmet or underfunded. However, despite the government declaring a low carbon development strategy a couple of years ago, there is very little mass pressure from below for mitigation and for a faster transition away from fossil fuels. At best, the support for certain policies that may provide co-benefits. As a consequence, what drives energy policies and choices in India is not so much climate change as much as energy independence and avoiding the fiscal burden of having to import fuels and, of course, falling solar prices, etc. Now, these drivers are legitimate, legitimate reasons in themselves, but they're not climate change motivated. And hence, the government has, in addition to the energy transitions that may have started, it has also weakened very key environmental provisions in the last couple of years, many of which would imply a worsening of climate change. And the government is also getting away with a hegemonic view that India has exceeded the targets that we have set in our NDC and that India is doing much better than other countries, which in my view is an incomplete and very partial viewpoint. Also, solar and so on might expand, but the development trajectory broadly remains unquestioned and unchanged. In fact, because we broadly have a right-wing government, in fact, for many years, it's sort of deemed as anti-national to question India's development trajectory. But energy transition has undoubtedly begun in India, but for the most part, it's in the electricity sector. 
electricity data from the Electricity Authority of India for the past few years suggests that the only capacity expansion is happening mainly in coal and solar, not in hydro, very slowly in wind and absolutely infinitesimal in nuclear is barely 3%. And if you consider actual generation, which is how we should actually be looking at renewables, 2023 data that I calculated show that renewables, renew, all renewables contribute only about 13%, 13% of India's electricity generation in 2023. If you include hydro, it's about 24%, which means that fossil fuels broadly are still responsible for about 75% of India's <coughs> electricity generation. And electricity is only about 20% of India's energy consumption as a whole. But what's really missing is two things. The urgency of the problem and the very long-term nature of the problem, that we are at the start of a very long curve of accelerating impacts. We need to be thinking far, far ahead. So in this context, what policies uh, are, I think, uh, sort of relevant? I'll just touch upon a few for want of time. Uh, briefly, I think to cushion, cushion the impacts of floods and heat stress, which are two of the large impacts, I think we need a massive expansion of more robust and better quality housing for the urban and rural, rural poor. This is linked to an expansion of a job employment scheme, which is one of the largest job employment schemes in the world, which is called the NREGA. And you need to link such work to an expansion of the NREGA. One needs to expand the compensation for agricultural damage. So it also includes more, we reaches farmers more quickly, more comprehensively, but also includes share coppers. Water is one of the worst crises that's also hitting us unequally in terms of the crisis of too little or too much water. And in particular, I would think it impacts poor women who are by far the largest social group already being impacted by climate change in India. And hence, we need to build or restore water bodies, lakes, ponds, and water harvesting, all of which are also possible under the job scheme, the NREJ. And finally, we need a faster transition away from fossil fuels. And despite the expansion in solar, like I said, the solar and wind are still only a small share of India's electricity generation. A lot of bottlenecks of why that hasn't happened, including uh, fiscal policies and so on, regarding why is it that coal is still so dominant, but it requires a longer conversation, but we certainly need a faster transition away. And finally, we need to plan ahead for a just transition. If you're talking of moving away from coal and so on, we need to be planning ahead, years and years ahead, to cushion the jobs that are going to be lost in the coal sector, in coal mining, in the thermal sector, in transport and so on, that requires years ahead of planning. And all of which we need to do with a much greater urgency and that can only come if there's much greater pressure from below. Thank you. Hello, I think this it is my turn. Thanks Manjari for um, the introductions and thanks for um, the India-China Institute for the invitation um, to, to participate in this panel and share some thoughts and reflections. I prepared a few slides that will cover various aspects of the climate politics in the Arab region. I, um, I really hope that you will make a coherent whole, but the idea is just to touch briefly on a few things and then perhaps um, we can discuss that after all, um, after in the Q&A. Do you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. So um, as, as the first panelist mentioned in the context of, of India, uh, climate change is impacting the whole planet and more so, even so, in the global south. And the Arab region is not immune of that. In, in fact, the climate crisis is already undermining the socio-ecological basis of life in the region. Um, we are seeing, you know, severe droughts that, that are impacting agriculture and small-scale farmers in a region that is heavily dependent on food imports, um, which makes the situation even worse. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you a little bit, give you a little bit of an idea about the impacts. Um, so Iraq is ranked as one of the world's five most vulnerable nations to climate change drought and, and desertification. And just in 2022, we've seen how many sandstorms just shut down much of the country with thousands admitted to hospital. 
We have also the question of wildfires, intensifying wildfires, specifically in North Africa, the southern Mediterranean part of the world. And um, these wildfires have become even more fatal. And um, we've seen how the ones in the summer of 2021 in my home country, Algeria, have caused um, huge destruction and damages, but also many fatalities. And as I, as I mentioned, the question of desertification that impacts um, the water question in, in, in the Arab region is a crucial point here because most Arab countries are predicted to be um, to become under the absolute water poverty level of 500 cubic meters per person per year by 2050. And many scientific studies and, and reports um, are predicting that um, a lot of the region in the Middle East and North Africa, even its very existence and the existence of its inhabitants is, is really threatened. The, um, we have also the, the, um, the phenomenon of the sea level rises that are even threatening the existence of whole islands in, in the Mediterranean, such as the Karkna and Jerba Islands in, in Tunisia. And the other phenomenon of the coastal erosion, which is really advanced in North African countries, specifically Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, and, and Egypt. And I wanted to to finish um, a little uh, talking about the impacts on what happened in Libya last September, um, September 2023, with the floodings that caused immense destruction and tragedy. Storm Daniel that started in Greece and went to Turkey and Bulgaria reached across the Mediterranean and reached Libya uh, in mid-September and is considered to be the deadliest Mediterranean cyclone recorded in history. We've seen how 24 hours of downpours, just which led to the collapse of two dams near Derna, ended up partly destroying the whole city and causing around 20,000 deaths. And I'm here contrasting the level of impacts between the northern Mediterranean, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, and the impacts in Libya. 20 fatalities in the top and 20,000 in um, the southern Mediterranean. And of course, there are many factors that go into here in terms of politics, in terms of economics, in terms of uh, geopolitics as well. But it's really worthwhile emphasizing the climate inequalities and injustices that we are seeing from the global north to the global south. And I believe that the floodings, the impacts of the floodings in Libya tell us a bit about the climate injustice in the world. And I here I wanted to share something that would bring us a little bit to the global picture in terms of the climate inequalities that we are seeing in the world. So this study that document, documented the cumulative CO2 emissions since 1750 to 2017 um, just gives a picture of the historical responsibility of the industrialized West, what we call the global North in causing the climate crisis. So just between the US, Canada and the EU and Australia, we have 50% of CO2 emissions. Um, and this echoes and goes line in line with the existing economic inequalities in the world today. So let's let's move to the second. I'm moving now to the second part of um, of my talk and talk specifically about the narratives and the discourses around climate change in the region and about the region. So who is shaping the climate discourse globally and in the region? So we have every year um, the climate talks taking place, what we call the COPs, the, the Conference of the Parties. But despite the escalating climate crisis, we, we see that the global elites still allow 
CO2 emissions to escalate. The Arab region hosted five of these talks since their inceptions in, in the 1990s. The most recent ones were COP27 in the military dictatorship of Egypt and COP28 in uh, the authoritarian regime UAE. And I think one point worth mentioning here is that the president of the COP28 in the Emirates was the head of the Abu Dhabi Petroleum Company, which just gives an idea how bankrupt and failing these climate conferences have become. Um, they are not just um, uh, blah, 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 as um, the Swedish Greta Thunberg, activist Greta Thunberg has said, but they have been hijacked by the corporate sector who are promoting those you know, profit-making false solutions from carbon trading to net zero to nature-based solutions, which are basically um, the same story, but with a green face. We have the same paradigm of capital accumulation, but just with a green face. And um, the main actors shaping the narrative and the discourse of climate change in, in the Arab region are international financial institutions such as the World Bank, international development agencies like the German GIZ, and also the EU development agencies. Um, while they are busy and very active in publishing reports in various languages, organizing events in climate change, these institutions are biased. They are aligned with the interests of the powerful and the rich and their views of climate change and the solutions they propose they do not take into account questions of class race gender power colonial history the, um, the solutions they promote are top down uh, they are market based and they push further for the privatization of everything you know, from the land, the resources, uh, food, energy, and even and even the atmosphere. And within that narrative pushed by these international actors with the complicity, of course, of the local ruling classes is the idea of North Africa or the Arab region or the deserts in the Arab regions as a kind of an Eldorado of renewable energy. So we have this Orientalist colonial environmental narratives that depict the Sahara, the desert in the Arab region as this vast, empty land, sparsely populated, representing a golden opportunity for Europe to get its green, cheap energy while continuing its energy intensive uh, production and consumption patterns. And of course, this narrative is deceptive because it ignores questions of property, sovereignty, it obfuscates the ongoing relations, global relations of colonial dominations that end up excluding local communities and workers from shaping that just transition that we talk about. And there are many examples in the region that show how um, the environmental and energy priorities of one region of the world, which happens to be the global north, the west, the Europe in, in this case, trumps the priorities of the, the, the Arab region. And we are seeing uh, examples of green colonialism, green grabbing, and the intensification of green extractivism. And a focus on export-oriented projects. I'm going to just go quickly through these examples because I don't have a lot of times, but we may come back to them in, in the discussion. So many examples from Morocco, for example, show how green grabbing, grabbing land without the proper consent and approval of local communities for supposedly green agendas. The moment you start looking as, or scratching under the surface of such projects, a bleak picture is revealed. These projects are basically run by private, mostly foreign companies. In this case, it's um, a consortium between Saudi and Spanish companies. Um, the project is losing is losing money. Uh, it contracted huge debts uh, on the backs of, of, of Moroccans. And on top of that, it, it uses extensive amounts of water in a semi-arid region. And 
uh, when we talk about climate justice and you know cl the politics of climate change in the region, we cannot forget Palestine, um, because even if Israelis and Palestinians are inhabiting the same terrain, the injustices and the inequalities, even in terms of impacts to climate change, specifically questions of water and droughts, are completely clear. Israelis are much more, you know, protected in terms of, of climate change because of settler colonialism, because of apartheid. And uh, using again, an, an orientalist, racist, environmental <laughs> narrative it is used to be to greenwash colonialism. Um, the other dynamic, main dynamic in the region is, is also the privatization of renewable energy and the focus on export. And there are many examples from Tunur in Tunisia. Tunisia still depends on its neighbor, Algeria, uh, on gas, but we see projects being pushed from outside Tunisia by various uh, Western investors to export green electricity to Europe. The same thing in Morocco with this x -Links project, planning to build large wind and solar farms in southern <laughs> Morocco, and then build cables um, that run from southern Morocco to the UK, so the UK can secure its energy security and reach its climate targets. So we are seeing the usual colonial scheme where we see an unrestricted flow of natural resources, in including green electricity or the energy from the sun, from the global south to the global north, while Fortress Europe continues building, you know, walls and fences and killing people in the Mediterranean. Um, so we, we are seeing that the priorities are, are lopsided, the, the, the creation of new sacrifice zones. So some people in other parts of the world would live better and feel better about themselves. And I'll finish by this slide, um, which is just a kind of um, a, a warning or a clarification that we cannot see the Arab region as, as an undifferentiated whole, as if everybody is in the same um, in the same level or in the same basket. First of all, there are class differences between wealthy and poor, but also at a regional level, the Gulf uh, countries or the Gulf region is just in another league and plays a role of a sub-imperialist force, perpetuating the same patterns of a plunder, grabbing, oppression, and dispossession, because Gulf capital is present in all the Arab region and also in other uh, countries in Africa and Asia, trying you know, to dominate those sectors, but also it is present in the sector of renewable energy. But what is important to say here is that the Gulf remains one of the core of contemporary fossil capitalism, and they are bent to be still um, the, the last man standing and extract every molecule of hydrocarbon. So this would constitute a big challenge to the global climate justice movement and any efforts to phase out fossil fuels. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, so now it's my turn to talk about the perspective from China. Uh, Grace, can you have my slides? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Li Bo. Uh, currently, I'm based in uh, Ottawa, Canada, but I'm affiliated with uh, Sanjay uh, Conservation Center uh, that has been doing a lot of um, uh, climate adaptation research in, in the operators of major rivers in China. Um, and, and uh, But today, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I would like to uh, propose as a question how renewables and low carbon public transit in China can be a, a climate strategy working with partners in global south. <clears throat> but uh, the reality is uh, pretty blue or, or even dark. 
I would like to think the decade before the new millennium and also the decade after the new millennium, probably pessimistically speaking from my 55 years of life so far, is probably the best time I lived, given what we are heading, which looks extremely dark. Uh, the previous two speakers have mentioned about climate change and the how much effort we have spent. You know, this last two decades, people work together to fight poverty, climate, food security, as well as on nuclear proliferation. And we thought we are actually heading somewhere uh, hopeful, but then the whole world is now soaked in wars. Can you go back uh, the last slides? I'm not done yet. If we believe our politicians are very sincere in fighting climate change, we wouldn't have ended up in current situation. War contributed enormously to climate change issues in terms of uh, food, supply chains, energies, and mass up everything that we have built up. I wouldn't believe if someone tell me those crazy people, woke up one day and decided that they want to fight wars. Wars are in the making for many years, and we knew it. Politicians knew it, but they didn't sincerely put their effort to, to stop the wars. And that's what we are facing today. We fight, we kill, as if there is tomorrow. If this escalate, keep escalate, we don't even know if we can actually do anything about climate. And right now, we are living in a world that we seem to have to make binary choices. Either you are with us or you are against us. And further divide humanities. And where can we go if we are divided? How can we really fight climate change? So the reality is really problematic right now. Next slide. When we talk about climate change, obviously there is no one size fits all strategies. Um, and we clearly see that from Chinese perspective. They are urban versus rural. China is a country that is rapidly urbanizing. Resources were privileged to urban centers and the rural areas are really suffering. Uh, and previous speakers have mentioned about various extreme weathers that affect people who are already disadvantaged. Coastal versus upland, upstream versus downstreams, majorities versus ethnic minorities, market driven solutions various uh, versus subsistence driven livelihood. There are a lot of issues, very complicated. And again, when we talk about renewables, we have learned from human history, one tax solutions always lead to a set of very complicated new problems. So when we put our face in technical solutions, we have to be aware, how can we address new problems before they become serious? <clears throat> Having said that, next slides, please. Having said that, I do want to uh, show the pathway of renewables in China. I became involved in nonprofit environment work in China in early 1990s. That, that was nine, 
the eighth five-year plan or the ninth five-year plan. At the time, Chinese NGOs were working on transparent decision-making of dams. And we have had a lot of campaigns. During that period, nine five-year plan and the 10th five-year plan, renewable energy in China was like nothing. There was nothing. The 11th five-year plan, I would regard that well, that is a, a, like an infant, infancy period of nuclear, uh, uh, new renewables, solar and wind. Uh, I still remember some of the meetings I sat with officials and they regarded renewables as kids game, as something that are completely a joke. But in the 12th five-year plan, which started in 2010, we really see something is changing. And uh, by the 13th five-year plan, started in 2015, the goal the government set for renewable to achieve was 15% of the total national uh, uh, generation capacity. It only took them a year. By 2017, a bit more than a year, they have already reached that goal. So really, the renewable energy in China really is like a Cinderella's fairy tale. It had a very shabby um, beginning, but within a period of less than two decades. Like by 2023, renewables already reached 1.4 terawatts or 1,550 gigawatts generation capacity, which is already 50%. Next slide. I think that significantly was attributable to the concerted effort in clean energy investment. And uh, this was made even stronger due to uh, pandemic and also various trade blockage. The, the Chinese uh, government and private sectors had to invest a lot more uh, in the domestic economy. So that has increased enormously the investment in clean energy. <clears throat> and according to IEA, by 2028, 60%, um, this is conservative estimate, 60% of worldwide generation capacity of renewables will be in China. Next slide. So this February, January and February, I was um, in China visiting uh, some um, uh, organizations uh, and also research institutions and some villages that I knew from before. Um, this is only from a long distance view, obviously, like uh, previous speakers have said. The, those new renewable energy constructions, they gotta be a lot of social issues um, when you look closer. But what I want to show you is basically, you know, the renewable energies have changed the landscape in the mountains. Next slide. Um, Let's talk about public transport. Before pandemic, a uh, lot of organizations, including nonprofit organizations that I worked with, were really looking at promoting um, e-bike, the bike share programs. And they have been a lot of effort 
launched and failed, and launched and failed. But this time, when I go back, the effort after pandemic actually resulted in a very nice program. The subways, when you come out of subways, you can ride on e-bike, electronic bikes or electronic motorbikes, um, and uh, also just bikes. It's so easy to rent a bike and to cover the last one miles of your travel to home or to offices. It's seamless. Please, next one. Those bikes different from uh, the time when I was um, still based in Beijing. Those bikes have solar powered the GPS tracker and the QR code with the APP to lock and unlock and the pay. They are so accessible. There are so many people who have decided to give up cars and uh, to move to public transport connecting with those e-bikes. I think this is a major progress in, in terms of public low carbon transport in urbanized areas. <clears throat> Next slide. And again, the promotion of e-motorbike um, and uh, was also very aggressive. Uh, the picture with a lot of uh, people on those, this is just outside of the Eastern Gate of Peking Universities. Uh, students, old and young, um, professors, um, all rode those bikes. <clears throat> and also in the uh, companies uh, that selling motorbikes, they have uh, the, the, the left side of the picture, you can see they have very easily accessible place to exchange batteries. When it's run out, they can just roll back and uh, deposit the old one and they got a new one. Next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, I want to put some ideas for us to think about. Climate doesn't care the size of the military muscles. Global South has been in action, opposing wars in UN, anti-war alliances, I believe is good for climate. And the Global South countries really is the force against the war. And the way everybody need to find even more effective ways to fight wars right now. If we have wars, we are not going to deal with climate crisis. The disturbance to trade and supply chains of renewable energy market, hopefully, will not affect the Global South countries as much, or the Global South need more concerted effort in promoting renewable energies that are socially just to the disadvantaged populations. And the third, public transit system in tandem with bike sharing as low carbon transportation solution really have a lot of potential from what I look um, in the last two decades or three decades, how it has progressed in urban China. I believe the similar experience can be applied in other countries in the global south. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and it's uh, hard to come last after such amazing and thought-provoking um, speakers. So I really do thank Manjari for the opportunity and for, for the previous speakers in inviting me for this uh, lovely meeting. And we've heard a lot about counter narratives of the current climate regime. We've heard a lot about how um, assumptions and uh, uh, current kind of like 
dominant narratives from the West have impacted the most vulnerable countries in the South. So I'm here to speak mostly about my, my current work with the smallest of islands. I am uh, the current advisor of many small island developing states that work within the climate regime that do not have the, the um, let's say the resources to launch a lot of counter narratives and they have to work with what they have. And what we have is a very imperfect system as the previous speakers have mentioned. But that does not mean that they're not incredible, um, let's use warriors since we've been talking about Cinderella and about uh, you know uh, all these type of um, imaginative um, discourse. They are incredible warriors trying to um, have a living chance for their country. So I'm going to speak, I have a, um, a presentation that I'll pull right now. Uh, so just bear with me a minute. Let's see. Oh, how do I go? Okay. Um, slideshow. All right. So here we are, and I think the first slide is really important to show because uh, for small island developing states, the um, the threshold of mitigation is mostly gone. You know. The, the as, as our first speaker mentioned, uh, we are almost at the 1.5 world. And so what does that mean for small island developing states, particularly for countries that are the lowest lying coastal countries in the world, right? So adaptation is no longer much of an option. We are in the era of loss and damage. What does loss and damage mean? It's um, where, um, you hit certain tipping points, the earth will not no longer recover. We, we will probably lose uh, territory, loss of non-economic um, values such as culture, songs. Um, uh, what happens with loss in territory? You lose a whole milieu of um, identity that is now at stake given the climate emergency. So I'm also speaking uh, on behalf of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is also um, a region that is not a priority in terms of uh, uh, like the big dominant uh, countries in the world. So it's a largely middle income country, it's low emissions, um, except for perhaps Brazil. Um, and it is extremely also vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change. And politically, politically speaking, it's very diverse. We hold polar opposites in the region in terms of uh, the spectrum of what political leaders say in the climate regime. And then we have the, the CIT, the Small Island Developing States, which is also, it, 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 it is uh, basically mostly uh, concentrated in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, and they are seen to be the clarions of climate change. They are the ones feeling the most existential threats to this crisis, given their, ter their small territory, usually their, their, their distance towards continents, and for them, climate is really a matter of life and death. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of how we work, because here we have the former minister of the Maldives, uh, uh, Mina Shona, and the vice minister, Haja. Both of them said very clearly, uh, here we are in COP26 in London, in uh, Glasgow, um, we want to continue living in the Maldives for the next 100 years, you know? This is what small island developing states want. They do not wish to move. They do not wish to become another group of my, uh, migrants that as others mentioned here before me are met with huge barriers to having well-being and a life of dignity. And in the closing statement of COP, um, Minister Shana mentioned her daughter, that's two years. I want my daughter to live in the Maldives. How do we address that? You know, how do we address the concerns and the demands, the imperatives of the small vulnerable? That is really our quest. And the UN was born for that, to protect the most vulnerable. So in our journey, we have become huge advocates of the loss and damage regime and how we design a fund that will um, hopefully address uh, some of the needs of the most vulnerable in the coming decades. 
before that, I'll just give you a little bit of a background on, on, on the progress of the convention and the climate negotiations. So here you have how in 1992, we set a goal of preventing um, dangerous anthropogenic, uh, uh, basically gases. And then in, in 2015, we have the Paris Agreement where we really shifted from a north-south divide into all countries need to take action. So that was a really big shift for our, our uh, collective kind of like consciousness and policy making in terms of there's no longer such north and south divide, but it is about everyone doing as much as possible, except in climate finance. In climate finance, there's still very much a north-south um, uh, divide where there is a historic uh, kind of responsibility of the North to um, provide resources for the West. But this year, the, there's a really big contention whether that wall will continue between North, north and South. Um, and I'll speak to that later on finance. And then in COP28, we, after a year of intense negotiations, we finalized and uh, agreed on the loss and damage fund. And there were other, other um, important uh, outcomes of COP, not uh, disregarding what Hamza said, because you know we, we live in a complex world. COP is both good and bad. <laughs> you know, there's people like Amina Shona and many, many great ministers fighting for a livable future within COP. So, uh, it is a much more complex uh, scenario than a black and white um, uh, thinking. So the trilogy of, of key priorities, this, the, the, this is what unites the G77, the group of the, the largest constituency of developing countries, which is the G77 and China. This is, uh, um, constitutes a, more than 100 countries from the South, and all of them have united in three fronts on adaptation, on finance, and on loss and damage. Partic and particularly for those that are not emerging economies, but for the larger South, adaptation, loss and damage, and finance have become fa uh, sandwiched in a proxy war between the emerging economies responsibility and the West. And so Maldives is usually, usually sandwiched between the interests of China and the US and the, and the small island developing States are the ones that are losing the most because of this um, battle of politics. Uh, so, so this is the trilogy. This is where we are at the moment. And so uh, on adaptation, we've now have a decision that is looking at seven uh, ambitious thematic targets on food, water, health, ecosystems, infrastructure, culture, poverty, and livelihoods. And IPI was at the forefront of developing this framework. We believe that adaptation is no longer a, a, a national thing, but it's transboundary. And we have to focus on some of these big thematic areas, such as water, which was mentioned by our, by our friend from India, infrastructure and transit systems that was mentioned by Boli. So uh, it is encouraging that at least we, we are looking into a framework that is thinking much more broadly of adaptation, because this is what, what developing countries want the most, how to adapt to the changing needs, to changing uh, crop conditions, how to provide food security, right? Then we have loss and damage, um, which as I mentioned before, is really at the cornerstone of the AOSIS agenda, the SITS agenda. And here we now have adopted a loss and damage fund and uh, we will be starting to set up the fund in next year um, that will hopefully provide some additional support that will not be dominated by um, current Western um, leadership, but it'll be more balanced between North and South uh, because it is, it, is, it is grounded really in the priorities of the South. And then this is the year of climate finance. We have uh, the 100 billion uh, goal, which expired. And now we're looking into what's going to be the new goal on climate finance. And here, uh, uh, 
Uh, India, for example, has mentioned that it has to be within the tri uh, trillions. Um, there is a, a wide gamut of an understanding of what should be the next um, climate finance goal. But for, for the, the smallest of nations, it's also about quality of finance. And most importantly, it's about reforming the current financial system, you know, changing the rules of the game, making trade more fair, changing how uh, we get direct access and how we get uh, funding with not all the loopholes and the burdens and the thousand consultants from external. So it's really about changing a mindset uh, that will that will uh, we will be fighting this year and about uh, leveling the playing field so that the smallest of nation, nations and Latin American nations that also get the, the least amount of funding um, have a better chance in the coming years. So um, I, I, I wanted to leave you with, uh, with that. For, for us, really, um, it's important, I think, to have a challenging narratives that hopefully try to make the climate regime better. But also, it's really also important to work with what we have um, so that we uh, we provide and we we shift the current systems for them to be more fair, to, re to for them to be more equitable, and for them to ref to reflect existing challenges and realities of the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimena, and thank you to all the other panelists too for bringing to the table um, a real range of issues, a range of temporalities, um, an awareness of the different drivers and stakeholders where for some the state is at the center, for others social movements, um, communities, grassroots communities, um, cities are all kind of important stakeholders. So we have a a, a real diversity, a real plurality of issues that have been put to the table, put on the table. Um, I want to invite members of the audience to put their questions in the Q and A box. And while you, while the audience does that, um, maybe I wanted to use this as an opportunity to invite the panelists, maybe to um, address each other about what, for you, perhaps has been an important or interesting takeaway from your fellow panelists regarding um, you know, possible lessons that might be relevant, let's say from China regarding its energy transition or from the small island nations regarding how they have managed to put certain kinds of counter narratives or new narratives um, on the table. Um, I'm, I'm just curious if you want to speak to each other about what you found to be important takeaways that you could take to your corner of the world, acknowledging that you all are operating in very different terrain. Uh, so Jimena, you had your hand up and now Graj, you too had your hand up. So Jimena, why don't you go first? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I do have a question for Nagra because you started saying that uh, for India, it's a big elections year, and we have elections in five other like major uh, countries uh, that have big populations. So I am wondering uh, about uh, that statement and about how elections are connected to climate in India, and how um, are there any tipping points or ways in which um, uh, we can shift that? Because India does play a really important role within the climate convention. They want to be seen as leaders and on equal footing with other major powers. So for them, the their, um, uh, how they're perceived is really important internationally. So how can that be used also uh, internally? Thank you. So should I respond now, Manjari, or do we take a couple yeah, of No, why, why, why don't you respond that and to that, and then you can bring to the table your own comments yeah, so, oh, all right. yeah so uh, if i was pronounce your name right um it it is uh climate change I, I must first point out that india has a long and rich history of environmental struggles and environmental movements it has a rich history of people's struggles over resources uh, uh over forests uh, over uh, the seas and and so on and so there's a very rich history of struggle let me, let me not in any way uh, belittle that right 
I'm talking of climate change and an electoral issue in contrast, say, to see about what, say, if you wanted to contrast, what, say, what's happened in the United States, in fact, in the last four or five years with the Sunrise Movement, with the within the Democratic Party, the left factions within the Democratic Party having to respond, having to put forward a Green New Deal, and it becomes a mainstream electoral issue. That has not happened in India. To some degree, it's happened in certain states, what you would call provinces or states in India, like the southern state of Tamil Nadu. Some political parties are taking up there. Uh, some of the left parties are beginning to engage more seriously uh, around, around the question and some of the other, etc. However, there are several reasons as to why it is uh, not a political issue. And that's partly because, one, I think that people have a variety of very grave and serious livelihood issues on their plate, which in a sense are in the forefront. And uh, for instance, the farmers have been struggling around the minimum support price right now because farming is largely unviable for small and marginal farmers. Right, That's one part. The second part, I think there's also a certain hegemony of the Indian government's position where there's a need for development and that kind of hegemonic position that that essentially that we have met our targets, that we've done enough and we are sort of going for doing better than other countries. That's a hegemonic position that's not been adequately questioned. Whereas in reality, I think the factors that our targets are quite modest, they could be a lot better. Uh, there's been some expansion of solar, but there's not been much expansion of wind in recent years. And I think broadly that comparison really not, should not be how we are doing vis-a-vis -vis other countries. It's a systemic problem. It's a global problem. And we in India are going to be facing very acute impacts for several years to come. And I think that is what we need to be thinking about. So what would be a tipping point? I think it would be a tipping point if one, if the youth were to take it up more seriously than they have, the youth have been in the last three or four, five years, a lot of young people, partly elite perhaps, but certainly young people have been more concerned, worried, and groups have come up, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, etc. That's partly there. I think mainly it has to be, I think, large social forces, women's groups, Farmers' organizations, trade unions, and so on have to be taking up this issue because it's something that's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. And that pressure needs to come from below. We got some of our more progressive acts in the last few years because there was that movemental pressure from below, like the Forest Rights Act, like the NREG, et cetera. But I think that also needs to be done with, 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 with the climate crisis, certainly. Okay. So, Nagraj, can I, can I just ask you a bit more on that front? Why has there not been an attempt to link the livelihood issues, to link the issues of, let's say, agricultural compensation um, to the broader narrative of climate change? Because the livelihood issues, issues of even air pollution, etc., are to some extent electoral issues in certain, you know, cities or areas. But why hasn't that narrative linkage been made in India? Well, air pollution certainly is a very, very widespread issue of concern. Uh, as far as climate issues, climate change itself is concerned, one, I think, is that it's sort of broadly in the last four or five years where we can visibly see accelerating impacts. And now it sort of it sort of gets beamed into your home. Now, every single extreme event or flooding event that's been happening in the last four or five years is now sort of beamed on TV. And there's an assumption that every flooding is caused by climate change. That awareness and the fact that this is an issue that's only growing, that it's not going to go away, that it's, impact, it's, it's impacting people. Let me not belittle that. It's impacting people on a very large scale. Literally in the millions, if you talk of small farmers or working people in terms of heat stress. So as an issue, it's impacting livelihoods and groups are beginning to talk about them, that this is something that's happening. But what is lacking is a kind of coherence. What is lacking is a sort of, if we consider it as one would look at sort of traditional movements, like say a women's movement or a working class movement, there is no climate movement in that sense. In terms of traditional with coherent demands, sort of targeting, coming together so in a sort of large coherent sense. And I think that's because one, as I was saying earlier, there are a lot of very other real livelihood issues on people's plates. It's a question of jobs, for instance. I mean, it's an extremely precarious time for working people. As you know, there's been a huge contractualization and informalization of work. So there's such insecurity about jobs among young people, right? And in that context, something like heat is something that you just have to manage. 
you see when your immediate thing is about a you know your where your nights food come from so in that sense those more immediate livelihood issues become more pressing rather than what seems like a slightly abstract and slightly more distant issue however the problem is that there is a lag as we know that there's a lag in impacts there's an inertia in the system and it is not going to go away it is there with us for centuries and that's why i think it needs sort of more advanced sort of plan yeah thank you uh, nagraj you also had your hand up initially uh, i had a couple of big questions for bo i will ask you bo regarding china a couple of things is is that what sort of driving this massive expansion of renewables in china because it's been undoubtedly pretty impressive in the last few years not not for certain the fact that china still consumes half the world's coal so we won't go there but this renewables expansion is undoubtedly impressive one is is climate change an issue that's driving for the for, for ordinary people is that an issue or is it mainly air pollution that was a driver that's one and secondly as china may consider to slow down its coal consumption what about the millions of workers who are in those occupations in the coal mines in the coal thermal etc is there a plan is government have a plan for those workers as a transition kind of unfolds uh uh thank you um the the facing out of coal and the the workers issue i think this uh um how do i put it the in the recent um couple of years let's say 5 or probably even 10 years the price of coal have been dropping and the uh, that um, is a deliberate effort by government and that has made a coal power plant profit decrease um and also um because the coal mining has had a lot of issues a lot of accident which result in people dying so i would say coal my and the coal power plant this industry is definitely a sunset industry even workers themselves a lot of workers say in the last decade have been dropping out of the 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 coal industries a lot of people there that like their counties or their prefectures their economy are a plummeting so they have to find their own livelihood either through retiring earlier with and the government give them some payment and they move relocate themselves to somewhere else this massive uh movement have been in motion for a number of years there are issues definitely workers rights and workers benefit but overall i think um it is both government and market are driving this industry um and particularly when the uh, renewables are coming up a lot of uh traditional or conventional power companies are also uh training workers like the coal the coal power companies they started to branch out to test renewables and they are able to train some of those workers to transfer their skills to the renewable industries and that has been happening like uh, the picture i showed you the wind um uh, turbines they are they belong to a conventional power companies in the past then they have been growing their renewable industries as a as a sort of a transfer um what is the first question i forgot you're muted nagran yeah sorry i was saying as a people's issue is sort of i know that air pollution is a huge issue in china is sort oh, of climate change yes. also a people's yes. issue as we've seen this massive flooding and heat stress in as china that absolutely absolutely um back in 2009 just one year after uh, china's uh, beijing's olympic game i was living in beijing 
my son was uh, only four year old. He coughed like a old cancer patient, a long cancer patient. Um, he sleeps next door and I heard him coughing. It was so painful to hear. And that has had major impact on the society and the call for government to take actions. Uh, this time when I go back and I talk to a lot of people, I can visually see the differences after they shut down a lot of um, um, polluting uh, business outside of Beijing. Um, you could say this is, uh, this is the convenience of one party system. They can shut down things, whereas in another country, multiple parties uh, system, and there will be a lot of demonstration and there will be a lot of workers demonstrate. Um, so yeah, it depends on how you look at it. In terms of climate adaptation, in terms of um, cleanup of the airs, uh, people do see some benefit of uh, efficient government uh, actions. I, um, in response to um, everyone's talk, um, I guess it really brings out different realities that different countries are facing. The island countries, um, I guess I read reports and I, uh, when I was attending conferences, um, I heard those voices. But again, today, uh, hearing uh, from, from Jimona, I find that to be extremely real and urgent for, uh, for the various international conventions or Global South to really drive these messages that small island countries, it's not really a choice of this and that, but it's a choice of be able to live at their homeland. And that's really shocking. And uh, for Hamza, I have learned today that um, it's renewable energy industries can be a new grab, a new colonial movement. And that's also a new uh, perspective for me. Thank you. And, and, and also food, food and agriculture. I actually uh, echo to Nagari's uh, uh, um, points. I believe food or famine, food-related crisis are probably equally important uh, to climate. This is sort of a double-edged sword. When we are trying to solve climate crisis, we are going to have more and more people not have access to food and this is going to be so difficult in many years to come. Thank you, Ibo. Hamza, did you want to come in? Yes, I can. Um, so that there are no questions from from the audience yet. Um, there's one, but why don't you first have okay. a say, and then I'll bring that. Okay. So um, it was good to be on this panel. Um, likewise, I learned a lot from from all of you. I think there are a few points that I think worth emphasizing. Um, the point made by Bo around climate and war, because the role of the war in exacerbating the climate crisis, or let's say the military industrial complex in exacerbating the climate crisis is under scrutinized and under analyzed. We don't talk a lot about the impacts of war and the militaries of this world like the biggest uh, militaries like the US. So this is something that we should really scrutinize because if we are for climate justice, we also need to be anti-war. 
and anti-militarization. And I think this is a very important point, and I completely agree. And then from, from all our conversation regarding the Global South, I feel that South-South relations need to be really strengthened. And they could be one way forward. Because if we are thinking about the energy or the just energy transition, one of the key or the cornerstones of that just energy transition is technology transfer, is green industrialization policy. Uh, in the world that we live in, um, usually unequal, where technologies are monopolized, where climate finance is not coming forward, I think we need to seriously think about ways of acquiring technology south-south and country, maybe learning from the Chinese um, experience. Because at least in the countries that I come from, the, the region I come from, that question of technology is very important because the foreign companies, they come, do the projects and there is no technology transfer. It's just for exporting energy. And then what did you create at the end? Where is the value? The value is exported somewhere else. So this is an, a, an important thing. And then in response to, to Jimena around the COP, of course we can disagree, but you know, I still consider the COP space one spaces that we should engage and you know struggle and push and limit the damage. Um, but that doesn't mean that we cannot say that space is becoming really bad, uh, being hijacked, the fossil fuel industry lobbyists, um, uh, the numbers escalated in the last three years, the market driven solutions, and even in terms of loss and damage, of course, it's a big step that we've seen since COP27 and then COP28, but it remains limited. That loss and damage fund has its own limitations because first of all, I feel it's toothless. It's not legally binding. Um, the money is not there yet. Of course, we'll start from somewhere. But I think we need to shift the narrative to outside the core process. So the climate justice movement creates a balance of forces from the outside to pressure the decision making makers to take concrete steps. Because if we rely on the core process, I think we lost the battle. Um, I don't feel it's the only space that we should focus on. There are other spaces and we need to connect the dots between various various struggles because we need to talk about climate reparations, not climate finance, not additional debts on already indebted countries. We need a, tr a transfer of wealth and technology, but the COP space is not, is, is, is not providing that. Um, so that just on, on terms of, on terms of the, the COP. And then in terms of adaptation and, and, and mitigation, like a country like Tunisia, a small country like uh, Tunisia, it is only responsible for 0.07% of annual CO2 emissions. But what we are seeing now is a lopsided climate strategy. Most of the finances and the money and the efforts is put into climate mitigation, building, you know, solar plants and wind farms, while the country is facing huge climate impacts in terms of water poverty and droughts and so forth. But those policies are shaped by those international financial institutions and development agencies that I've been that I've been talking about. So we need we need to be careful in in what we are pushing in terms of climate adaptation and mitigation. I feel climate adaptation should be the priority and the things that most countries in the global south focusing but it doesn't mean that those countries uh, are are not needed to move towards renewable they have to but i think it needs to happen at different rhythms if especially if we are talking about equity and justice thank you hamza so actually let me himena you want to come in and um and then there is a question that I want to maybe end the panel with, which is for Hamza, but I think relevant for all the other panelists. But Jimena, why don't you respond to Hamza? Uh, yes, and I want to share this uh, slide um, very, fairly quickly with you because um, I couldn't agree with Hamza more actually, because our work is focusing the inside and outside. We need both. We need to entirely change this climate finance landscape that I'm showing you. And if you look at this map, 
it um it tells you a story, right? So this is the total amount of money going into climate. And so the blue is public and the orange is orange. And if you look at this, it, how small is the grant? Only 69 um, uh, uh, million, I think, million. And then you have adaptation, 63. That's tiny, tiny compared to mitigation, right? And, and if you look at, at the, the private sector and the public, so really are what we really need to do, particularly in this year, which is the climate finance year, is expand both the grant uh, uh, thing to become a, a much bigger pot for, for vulnerable countries and the adaptation pot. This is, it's, it's really incredible that it's so small amounts compared to the other parts of the system. And loss and damage is not even here <laughs> because it's before uh, we, uh, these numbers are before we agreed on, on, on loss and damage. So we truly do need to change our, our um, entire climate finance landscape towards a, a, towards a more uh, equal paradigm in which the grant-based funding the loss and damage and uh, and, and adaptation uh, pots become much larger for the needs in the coming future where you will see you know massive migration flows as never seen before our our human systems will all be impacted by climate this offers a huge moment for creativity this panel should not end in a tone of fear but a tone of 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 knowing that we can change this, that we can design systems that will enable us to live well-being in, with a life of dignity. Yeah, Jimena, I think that's a good point to underline. And I think if there's one thing that's come out of this panel is the need to work on a diversity of different scales, different forums with different narratives. But before we wrap up and we still have a couple of minutes, I did want to bring a question from one of our students, Mara Levy. Um, it's for Hamza, but it's something that would be relevant to all of you if you have time to very quickly go around. So the question is, in a way, Hamza, you seem to have brought the most radical and maybe idealistic perspective on the change we need. Do you feel that this perspective is widespread within the climate justice movement in the North African context that you're involved in? But also, do you see any current instances of or the potential for a global counter hegemonic climate justice movement centering intersectionality and neocolonialism? If so, in what ways and how would you imagine such a movement to relate to more pragmatic efforts that try to work within the current system? For example, the crucial finance initiatives pushed by SIDS. So in some ways, I feel as though we, the conversation we've had has addressed this, the, these questions, but I still did want to bring it to the panel. So maybe very quickly, Hamza, you, and then anybody else from the panel who wants to address the points that Mara has brought up. Yeah, just quickly, I th I think it's um it's not just one question there. It's three or four questions <laughs> that deserve more unpacking. But um, I'll ju I'll just touch quickly on it and then leave space to 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 other panelists as well to to contribute. Of course, there are different um, views and perspective on questions of climate uh, on the response to climate crisis in the region, but one of them is um, the perspective I gave because it is rooted in some of the movements and the partners and the activists and scholars working on those issues in the region. Um, because what we are seeing, as I said, is the externalization of the social environmental costs that we see in fossil capitalism to the renewable energy era uh, in terms of green grabbing, in terms of green colonialism, in terms of even grabbing water resources to produce green hydrogen to export to the EU and, and Germany. So the same neo-colonial things. And there are movements resisting this at various levels. There is a food sovereignty movement in the Arab region trying to push against, you know, the land grabs and the water grabs. There are also 
the trade union movement who started incorporating the matters of energy democracy into its discourse and environmental justice as well in terms of fighting privatizations in terms of fighting land grabbing and in terms of fighting those foreign companies that come and benefit for, from the infrastructure for export um, priorities so that those questions are being discussed and debated but they are also there are also intersections because they are not happening in a vacuum most of the Arab countries are non non democratic. Some some of the countries there is no space for discussion and debate. Um, you cannot even organize. So the and some countries are facing wars and destabilizations like Libya, Yemen, Palestine, Iraq. So there are varying realities in the Arab region. So it's really hard to say there is a homogeneous climate movement in the region because there are different interests and there are different contexts and, and realities. But, um, but like Jimena, I'm hopeful, even if things do not look good or not as good as we want them to be, I feel that people always rise and organize and fight back. Um, I think one of our roles is um, to document what is happening, to reveal the various dynamics of, of capitalism and what the corporate sector is doing in order to fight better, to resist better. And, and, and I think that would shape our strategies in, in the short to medium and long term. Yeah. I'll graduate very quickly and then maybe we'll wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to say that, you know, uh, the fact is that there's a range of kind of intellectual critiques of capitalism that have come up in the last several years. I mean, in the 90s, capitalism was completely hegemonic and dominant. That is not the case anymore. And that's partly because of the climate crisis. Climate crisis is clearly one of capitalism's biggest failures. And there's a range of intellectual critiques. So there's a question of degrowth, post growth all kinds of other ecological things. That's one. Secondly, I think that I, where we need to work is I think we need to work at different levels, different levels simultaneously. And we need to go out of our comfort zone and be willing to work with different people that we may not have been willing to earlier, both in terms of social forces and in terms of what are acceptable strategies. So we work both at levels of a systemic critique but also work within the system, trying to push certain things, trying to expand renewables, but do it in a way that's just. Unlike what, like what Hamza was saying, it should not be unfair on the communities, but there's that as well. So I'm saying there needs to be a simultaneously, because it is a crisis, and that crisis is going to be there for a very, very long time. So let's work with hope, but also I think with resolve. I think we need resolve as much as we need hope. I mean, them both, Ilya. Thank you, Nagraj. That's perhaps the perfect note to end this panel on. Um, so I have a couple of tasks left. The first and most important one is to thank each of the panelists for sharing your time, your thoughts, and joining us today. Uh, I would also like to thank the India-China Institute team, which always ensures that this takes place seamlessly. Grace, Mayank, my co-director, Mark Fraser, uh, Michael in IT. Um, but finally, I also want to flag a couple of additional events that the audience might be interested in. Perhaps most relevantly, Hamza is going to be at the New School in person on April 16th um, for a panel organized by the Graduate Program in International Affairs on Dismantling Green Colonialism, Energy and Climate Justice in the Arab Region. Um, so I hope some of you will be able to join us there. Um, and also the India-China Institute's programming for the semester continues, and it will be hosting a small seminar series consisting of three talks on China and international development, instruments, finance, and infrastructures in the months of April and May. And I think that will allow us to also, along with Hamza's April 16th panel, uh, continue this conversation about South-South, um, lessons, cautionary notes, and um, you know, new narratives and counter narratives that can be uh, brought to the table. So with that, I'm going to close this. Thank you to the audience for joining us today.